Hello, I'm Pam Hoffman, Everyday Spacer. I'm Jeff Miller, 2049 Outfitters. At Everyday Spacer, we show regular folks how to personally and directly participate in space exploration, science, and astronomy. We're here on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, 12 midnight Eastern Time, and 2 p.m. on Saturday in Queensland, Australia. We're broadcasting live from Thousand Oaks, California. Last week's trivia question was, what programming language did they use to land Apollo on the moon? Hi, right, Cliff. Cliff we meet again. Yeah, Southern yep. Hemisphere. All right. Uh, anyone want to take a stab at it? Because I've got it all set up. And uh, I will be happy to talk you through that. Want to share the screen for us, Jeff? Sure. Thanks. All right. So this comes from the Wikipedia page, Apollo Guidance Computer. Now I scrolled down about halfway through, and that's right here. The AGC, that's the Apollo Guidance Computer, software was written in AGC assembly language and stored on rope memory, which is really fascinating. If you get a chance to take a look at that, I encourage you to do so. Oh, hi, Daniel. Welcome. Yeah. APL1? No, not APL1. quite. Oh. Not quite. Here we are. It's uh, the bulk of the software was on a read only rope memory and thus could not be changed in operation. But some key parts of the software were stored in standard read write magnetic core memory and could be overwritten by the astronauts using the DISCI interface, as was done on Apollo 14. Yeah, hi, Don. Hi, Don. Welcome, folks. And Scott. And yeah. Scott. We're so glad you're here. All right. So bring us back, Jeff. Oh, that's that magnetic core. Interesting. And there's the, well, assembly language is a type of computer yeah. language. Anyway, let's see. Where are we? This is the planet Earth, right? Um, did anybody get that? <laughs> if oh. you like the trivia questions, we'll keep doing them. If you don't, we can stop. Yeah, Daniel came close. It was um, actually very similar. Oh, interesting. APL1 okay. came after this. I mean, okay. Okay. I, I didn't know what that was. I'd never seen... APL yeah. one before for yeah. computer language. All right, well, you're up. Oh, I am. Hi, guys. <laughs> That's what it says. Tonight, we're doing a profile on Margaret Hamilton. We'll be back in 8.3 seconds. Margaret Elaine Hamilton is an American computer scientist, systems engineer, and business owner, and she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2016 for what she is best known for, developing the onboard flight software, which helped land Apollo 11 on the moon. Hence our trivia question. Oh, oh man, you do not want to do a typo. I don't know what you're referring to, Cliff. Um, oh, for the computer. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It was actually On very, very mission, dynamic. Yeah. And, you know, I forgot to show you some things because something really cool happened. Uh, share screen. I'll, I'll get back over there. I had posted happy anniversary Apollo 11 crew. They landed on the moon 54 years ago today. And I put some uh, interesting little meme pictures in there. And with a the computer, they landed on the moon. With a computer less powerful than your cell phone, I got lots and lots and lots of comments. I did mean to share these before we started the uh, bit about Margaret Hamilton, but it ties in because she's one of the people that did the programming for it. And uh, Tim says their computer was uh, way more capable than people give it credit for. And I didn't know much, so I asked him to tell me more. And he talked about several books, which he names out uh, below here. Here's Paula Guidance Computer and also in Paula's Computers, which I have links for here in a second. And I put them in the uh, comments area of the, um, the YouTube and the um, Facebook pages where, we, where we're broadcasting. All right, so let's see. And then we had some other people weigh in about the code being incredibly efficient. I kind of get an idea about it now because of this profile of Margaret Hamilton. Uh, and that rope uh, was part of it. The code was part of it. Anyways, it's fairly interesting. Then there's some really cool pages that I also have up for you from Pat Bond and a couple other people. <laughs> My cousin's son 
My Apple Watch has more computing power and probably storage than the Apollo computers did. It's kind of amazing both how much was done with those computers and just how much further in relatively so little time our computer technology has come. This is a great uh, video. I have that up here too for you to show real quick um, from Sam. And Michael Kelly actually uh, knows a lot about this computer because he did some study of it. So, uh, yeah, come over to um, my Facebook page with this. Um, oh, I, I'll give you this link. How's that? Yeah, sounds good. And then I will also show you these pages. Because, okay. uh, yeah, go ahead. You want back to us? or No, know? not yet. Okay. Not yet. Uh, because I want to show you, here's the one book. The Apollo Guidance Computer Architecture. Like I said, I have a link to that in the notes of the both places, uh, Facebook and YouTube. Also, this book, Apollo's Computers. Uh, it's a Kindle edition, but you can get the paperback too. All right. And so these were some other links. Um, Apollo Guidance Computer Explained. And this one's pretty dense. It's, um, it's kind of hard to read though. Then this video. I thought this was a really cool video. As you see, I'm about halfway through it. <laughs> So, okay, we'll go on to Margaret, and this is a fairly famous picture of her. As you can see, her software, and I think this is actually the various softwares they worked on, are about as tall as her when they're printed out. Oh, got Ann Hall. Welcome, Ann Hall. I believe this is the first time for you here, and we're so glad you're here. All right, so there, of course, is the Wikipedia page, and it's a great place to start, but you want to look for Margaret Hamilton, and I actually put in NASA, or you could use Software Engineer, because there is another Margaret Hamilton who is not the person I'm talking about. This Margaret Hamilton is actually still around. She's 87 years old, and uh, she was a computer... She, Go she ahead. looks a bit like Carrie Fisher in that shot. Yeah, she does. <laughs> um, so... You know, she, she did a bunch of things before becoming a, uh, a computer person that worked on the Apollo program. Uh, but she did study as a computer scientist, systems engineer, and a business owner. She was the director of software engineering division at the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory. And they, they're they the ones, the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory, which became Draper Labs, developed this onboard flight software for NASA's Apollo program. And then she founded two software companies later. Um, but I think it's very interesting that she published many, many papers. It says more than 130 here. Hey, Cliff. Um, I have seen them very complicated, but just the power of a four problem calculator. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know. Um, people have said that they're more complicated than, than we realize, but they really weren't. It's just that people were really, really clever about getting the very most they could right. out of such limited resources. Right. And I, that, I will that agree was, with that statement. That right. was the real genius of the programming is that yes. they managed to get every single little bit of, of performance they could. And she basically, <laughs> well, they say invented the term software engineer. Some, some places I've seen it that she popularized it. Uh, and who knows, a lot of things like this, are basically they basically grow organically from a variety of different places but you know she's the one that began to use this term like it says i began to use the term software engineering to distinguish it from hardware and other kinds of engineering yet treat each type of engineering as part of the overall systems engineering process so she was right at, at the genesis of all of this and uh they talk about her award here the presidential medal of freedom that was presented by Barack Obama for her work leading to the development of the onboard flight software for NASA's Apollo moon mission. Now, don't don't be fooled. This was a lot of people people's effort. The thing about it was she was one of the first people to be hired to do the work, and then she was in charge of the whole team later. So, all right, it talks about. Of course, you've got you know the basic information here: birth, education, occupation. Uh, and so forth. The different uh, spouses, children, relatives, awards. There's a, there's more than that. We have a page for that as well. Um, so she was born in Indiana, but she basically um, got her training in Michigan. Then she um, spent a lot of time on the East Coast. Um, well, she went where, to U of M. Yeah. Mm -hmm, where uh, MIT is, because that's where she, a lot of her work was. 
uh, in Boston. She um, she was gonna enroll in and study abstract mathematics. However, <laughs> she had a couple of positions before that. And this is really interesting. I think she she was developing software per, to predict weather, which is actually a pretty hard thing to do. Um, and she was also part of Marva Minsky's project Mac. Let's see what that says there. Oh, on the Here's PDP one. Oh, you Dang. know something about that? Well, let me put it this way. I used the PDP 11. Okay. So. All right. <laughs> and, and that was, even at the time that I was using it, was fairly primitive. Got it. And so uh, contributed work to <clears throat> chaos theory. Uh, let's see. At the time, computer and science software engineering were not established disciplines yet. The, the programmers were learning on the job. They were, mm -hmm. you know, hands-on experience, which, which you did when you were in high school, right? Right, yeah. All right, so so she did a bunch of things before that, including this uh, semi-automatic ground environment project at MIT. And, uh, yeah, and she, she really broke a lot of barriers because, of course, she was one of the very few women involved with this. But she worked on a lot of really interesting projects. And I think that's part of what helped her to get the job creating the software for the Apollo, um, the Apollo, you know, the basically the spaceships. All right. Well, and I think she was possibly helped by the fact that calculators, which before we got the um, mechanical and then electronic versions, mm -hmm. was a job position of one who calculates. And most of those were women. Typically were women. So, because it was thought their work was they were more thorough and methodical, and, and yeah. yeah, so and but I don't think that that's where she and she kind of came from. And at the time that it came, the men were too busy shooting at each other in World War II, so okay. no, but but this the software engineering bit, there's definitely yeah. a lot of men involved with it, right? Um, but, because they're programming, not they're not the computers exactly, there's, there's subtle differences between them. Mm -hmm. Um, so she was on the more programming side than computing side. I would right. say the, com the computers were just, you know, doing the math parts of it, plus, mm -hmm. minus, you know, all those mm -hmm. things, just strictly um, mechanical work. Yeah. And then but the difference. Programming was more of a. Um, yeah. The different engines were, um, were coming out. And there were a lot of women working on that because they went from just doing the calculations to working on the machines that then did the calculations. Yeah. So that kind of led into that. So yeah, I I can see software engineer or you know programming as being like the toe into the door for that sort of thing for mm -hmm. women. Because it was okay. kind of they were kind of lined up for it to begin with. Yeah, we see some of uh some of that kind of thing um uh, revealed in hidden figures, the movie mm -hmm. Hidden Figures. Yep. Yeah, it's oh, a comment. Oh, so forth. So hey, you're welcome back. back. Yeah. <laughs> Cliff has one too before that. Yeah. Um, oh, I and I saw one over there and here on display in 2019 and other stuff. I think you're talking about the um, the Apollo computer, right? Um, oh, very good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we had a picture over here. Is this what you're talking about, Cliff? Yeah. Let us know. Yeah. Well, and I've seen the screens. Um, emulated on a website somewhere, and I'll, I'll look. I'll try to find it okay. where you can um, essentially program it. Oh, neat. Okay. Yeah. All right. So she did all these different things. Um, oh, and I love this part. I wanted to read this to you because um, uh, what she, she goes, what they used to do when you came into this organization as a beginner was to assign you this program, which nobody was able to ever figure out or get to run. When I was the beginner, they gave it to me as well. And what happened was it was a tricky program. And the person who wrote it took delight in the fact that all of his comments were in Greek and Latin. So I was assigned this program and I actually got it to work. I, it even printed out its answers in Latin and Greek. I was the first one to get it to work. She beat the Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. And, the, and here it is. It was her efforts on this project. This is that sage uh, self semi-automatic ground environment uh, that that helped her get into the NASA. Um, it, it was a it was a contractor, it wasn't NASA? A lot of the people that worked for NASA were contractors. Like four hundred thousand of them worked on Apollo. All right. So then they do talk. about here's that picture of her again. Um, 
the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory and the Apollo Guidance Computer. When she joined the MIT Laboratory, which becomes Draper Labs, I, guess, I think it is eventually, uh, we'll see that soon. Uh, they developed the Apollo Guidance for the Apollo Lunar Exploration Program. She was the first programmer hired for the Apollo project and in 1965 became the director of the Software Engineering Division. There it is. The, she was the first one to be hired and then she became the director. Probably probably pretty unique at that point for, for a woman. She was responsible for the team writing and testing all onboard in-flight software for the Apollo spacecraft. Uh, I love it here too. A little bit later on, it talks about um, her daughter did something to trigger an error in the, in the program. And they were like, oh, the astronauts are trained not to make that kind of mistake. And yet one of them did. We'll see that. <laughs> so I think it's fabulous how she was very, she would think outside the box and, and really try to figure out, well, what could possibly happen? What could the astronauts do and how, and how to, work make sure that you know even there even if there was an error it would work out okay uh and we'll we'll see too how uh and and may, many of you probably know this um what happened when they're about to land with very very little fuel left was there was a pretty bad problem with the computer um but these guys were trained to just sit and wait and see what happens and sure enough this computer which basically it never really crashed. Uh, it came back on and it worked and it landed them on the moon safely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really think, fascinating. I stuff. think what happened is that it had too much in, input too fast and the, and the, and the computer just couldn't handle that. Um, yeah. They get into more specifics yeah. here. So stay tuned for that. You'll, you'll see Jeff. Um, okay. Let's see uh, some good stuff in here. And I encourage you to come and look at this too, because she's a really, really interesting person. And I think she was ahead of her time and being a woman, you know, in a very unique position like this, there's a lot of really good stuff in here. All right. So let's see. Um, yeah. The detection. Uh, I think I'm going to read this part. This included error detection and recovery software, such as restarts and the display interface routines, also known as the priority displays, because that's important to what happened when Apollo 11 was coming down to the moon. And, and we'll see, it talks about, it can handle like seven things at once and they tried to make it handle eight mm -hmm. and it says no wait a minute i have to prioritize and it did yeah we got a comment i saw yeah, a couple um daniel computer was a job occupation in the 40s yep. and 60s and the human computer would often use a calculator yeah and usually it was like creating tables mm. the lookup tables and i remember those lookup tables engineering tables they would call them you plop them down, you find the calculation, and it'd be out to like eight or nine decimal places. Oh wow! And um, and it, because at the even when I was in college, the computers that could handle that were expensive, and you had to get time on them. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and Cliff, that and capsules, huge display. Oh yeah, so they had the computer and the capsules, nice. huge display by NASA, uh, the LEM module that was being fixed up and got to play with it in the, in the Brisbane, Brisbane Museum. Brisbane, okay. Brisbane. Very cool. All right, so let's see. And again, you, you want to come and read this because there's a lot here. Uh, her areas of expertise included system design, software development, and enterprise and process modeling development paradigm, formal systems modeling, and it goes on and on and on. She, she was really something. She is really something because she's still around. Uh, I think this is a really cool picture too. I think she's um, managing the rope part of this. Uh, and I think there's some pictures here too. We'll see how that goes. Um, oh, here it is. In one of the critical moments of the Apollo 11 mission, the Apollo guidance computer, that AGC, remember AG, yeah, AGC, Apollo guidance computer, together with the onboard flight software, averted an abort of the landing on the moon. Three minutes before the lunar lander reached the moon's surface, several computer alarms were triggered. According to the software engineer, Robert Wills, Buzz Aldrin entered the codes to request that a computer display uh, altitude. And that's the eighth thing that was one too many. And the system was designed to support seven, here it is, seven simultaneous programs running, which is kind of remarkable to me for this day and age. 
but Aldrin's request was the eighth. This action was something he requested many times whilst working in the simulator. The result was a series of unexpected error codes during the live descent. The onboard flight software captured these alarms with the never supposed to happen displays, interrupting the astronauts with priority alarm displays. Hamilton had prepared for just this situation years before. There was one other failsafe that Hamilton likes to remember. Her priority display innovation had created a knock on risk that astronaut and computer would slip out of sync just when it mattered most. As the alarms went off and priority displays replaced normal ones, the actual switch over to new programs behind the screens was happening a step slower than it would today. Hamilton had thought long and hard about this. It meant that if Aldrin, say, hit a button on the priority display too quickly, he might still get a normal response. Her solution, when you see a priority display, first count to five. So she was programming the astronauts too. <laughs> All right, so we kind of know that what's happened there. It was was programmed for seven jobs. They tried to make it do eight, and it says, no, 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 hold on. And it rejiggered and prioritized what they absolutely had to have. I mean, think about it. It was a very limited computer in some respects, mm -hmm. and they were about to hit the surface of the moon. So, yeah, you really want to make sure you've got the right thing as the priority job. <laughs> All right, let's see. And there's more about that whole business. Uh, but I think there's some stuff below here I wanted to talk to you about, too. And, and definitely take a look at this. This is really good stuff. Uh, yeah, again, it, it was smart enough to recognize that it was being asked to perform more tasks than it should be performing. I think what's remarkable, too, is that there's this rope, there's software, and, and there's, you know, working with the astronauts to make sure they do the right things, you know, count to five, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is really, really an amazing job, which she did exceedingly well. So uh, yeah, she went on to, to do businesses, uh, higher order software to further develop ideas about air prevention and fault tolerance, you know, coming from this experience. Um, so I don't know if you've heard of this use.it. No. Okay. So I don't know, I don't know much about these companies and these, uh, these, this work that she's doing, but I'm sure that it's, uh, it's out there somewhere. It's probably been rolled into something that I learned, but long before I learned it. Yeah. And, uh, there was one other one. Let's see. Uh, where is it here? CI Def, automated version of IDEF, a modeling language developed by the U.S. Air Force. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's it. And uh, so, yeah, she's uh, been credited with the naming the software engineering uh, discipline. And she details how she came to make it. I like this, too. Uh, when I first came up with a term, no one had heard of it before, at least in our world. It was an ongoing joke for a long time. They liked to kid me about my radical ideas. It was a memorable day when one of the most respected hardware gurus explained to everyone in a meeting that he agreed with me that the process of building software should be also should also be considered an engineering discipline just like with hardware not because of its acceptance of the new term per se but because we had earned his and the acceptance of others in the room as being an engineering field in its own right and i remember when i was uh studying uh, electronics engineering technology at school one of the things that we learned was hardware kind of has a limit software however does not so you can use some of the same hardware over and over again, but the software is going to be constantly um, improving. So, yeah, this is this was a very important breakthrough in this field, and and so she was she was a big part of it. Well, software has a limit. It's limited by the hardware bozos. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> I think that sounds like an argument we're not going to get into tonight. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, it was not taken seriously compared to other engineering. Yeah. It is now, nor was it regarded as a science. I think she helped change that. Yeah, she was she was concerned with legitimizing software development as an engineering discipline, and it is. Uh, over time, the, the term software engineering gains the same respect as any other technical discipline. IEEE Software September issued 
uh, October 28th issues celebrates the 50th anniversary of software engineering. How cool is that? She also talks about errors and how they influence her work related to software engineering and how her language USL could be used to prevent the majority of errors in the system and some other citations they make. Um, I, I think it's interesting too. I mean, they've got her awards here and that's great. I got another page about that too, but they have her publications and there's no way that that's 130. <laughs> so there's probably a lot more out there if you are so inclined to take a look. Then they say something about her personal life. She's She was married twice um, and has a daughter. Lauren, oh, here it is. Let's see. Uh, oh, I don't see uh, the part about Lauren. Maybe it's a different page. So uh, hopefully we'll get to that because she because Lauren was the one who, who did something. And oh, the astronauts will never make that mistake. And they did. Well, <laughs> so. If you find out that a mistake is possible, <laughs> yes. you have to deal with it. <laughs> I think you should strongly consider dealing with it. Yes, absolutely. Because if that's going to happen once, it could happen again. Right. And you can't train every single user. <laughs> Everybody's different. Even even like, when you think about your car, they could develop their own little quirks. And they're all different too. Yeah, but I just go, the, you know, making something foolproof. <laughs> and the universe just considers that a challenge. <laughs> Quite possibly. So there's some good pages on like the NASA... And this is solar system exploration. There's some other ones here too, uh, about her and you know her work at MIT and so forth. Um, oh, that was an interesting picture on the side there. Oh, here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Is it forty years after? Oh, okay. There's a story. So you want to go to this page? Take a no. Look. I just yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just thought it was an. Recalling I saw her. the giant leap. Okay. We'll go there. We'll, we'll take a look. It's live. We can do that. All right. So let's see. Um, there's going to be a lot of the same kind of information, but I wonder if this is where the, yeah, they talk about her. Yeah, we had to find a way and we did. They were definitely pioneers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess this picture was taken in 69. However, it kind of made a splash when there was social media to post it to and oh and here it is here margaret is shown standing beside listings of the software developed not the software i thought it was the software but it's listing of the software developed by her well, and that, the team that is the software okay a I listing see. is a printout of the software okay got it oh. yeah we had a comment oh cliff lauren was born one month after me okay all right so let's see um yeah this, again it's her and her team but she was in charge of them she was in charge all right so let's see what else does it have in here nope that's pretty short all right so we clicked over to here um and let's go to that page and see what they've got recalling the giant leap oh it was fairly recently 2009 40th anniversary uh, let's see. So they're talking about, yeah, did we get another comment? Yeah, I Daniel, was... since AGC had <laughs> four kilobytes and the average smartphone has eight gigabytes, <laughs> the AGC was two million times less powerful. Right. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Quite, quite stunning. But they landed on the moon with that. Yep, they did. Several times. Uh, it, it was actually pretty dynamic. Uh -uh. Yeah. And it was largely due to Margaret and her team. So let's see what it says here. Anything we find really cool? Doo, doo, doo. I don't see that picture, Jeff. No. That was just a clickbait picture, I Maybe. guess. Maybe. Oh, they talk about some people involved. All right. Well, absolutely. If you want to click on that picture, I definitely recommend it because yeah. there's some good stuff in here. Uh, all right, but what I had also was another NASA page, NASA Science, oh. um, about Margaret Hamilton. Oh. oh, my friend wrote a lunar lander game in one line of basic code. Wait, one line? <laughs> wow. It was a really long line. I see. But okay. um, you could do that in basic. Oh, I it, see. Um, you get failed for doing that in basic. What? Because it can be one long line. Okay. But it's 
hell to read. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. No, not recommended. Um, okay. But, um, well, in fact, I think everyone in high school who learned basic did a lunar lander program. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. How interesting. All right. So let's see. Um, and, and there's going to be a lot of different pages, of course. Uh, they will have a lot of the same information. Uh, but let's see. Was there something? Oh, yeah. We were the luckiest people in the world. I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> she really loved her job. She loved mm -hmm. doing this. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, there's about the photo. <laughs> Made the rounds on social media. Well, in fact, it just goes to show that she was a software engineer. Because engineers love solving problems. Ah, uh, yes. All right. Okay, just some information there. Um, I don't think there was anything significant I wanted to share out of there. Oh, here's that page from the Smithsonian. She led NASA software team and landed astronauts on the moon. So some really good stuff in here. Um, one of these has her, um, the awards. I wanted to talk about that a little bit more. And, of course, she's still around. So who knows what's, what she'll develop next. <laughs> uh, I think this was kind of interesting. Um, let's see, get back up here a little bit, maybe. Software which allowed the computer to recognize error messages and ignore low priority tasks continued to guide astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin over the crater pocked dusty crust of the moon to their landing. It quickly became clear, she later, later said, that the software was not only informing everyone that there was a hardware related problem, but that the software was compensating for it. An investigation would eventually show that the astronauts' checklist was at fault, telling them to set the rendezvous radar hardware switch incorrectly. Fortunately, the people at Mission Control trusted our software, Hamilton said, and with only enough fuel for 30 more seconds of flight, Neil Armstrong reported the Eagle has landed. <laughs> so a uh, bit of a nail biter there. Daniel says the secret is burning oh, for the lunar lander program. Yeah. It's for us at just the right time to run out of fuel at zero altitude and velocity. Yep. <laughs> Yes. Uh, let's see. What was I thinking about? That was uh, the the fact that they trusted mm -hmm. her 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 and her team software. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love this too. The achievement was a monumental task at the time when computer technology was in its infancy. The astronauts had access to only seventy two kilobytes of computer memory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 72 kilobytes. Yeah. Of course, it was Bill Gates who said, oh, was it 64? 640K. Who's no, 64. Gonna... 64K. It was 64K. No. I know. I've seen it. I know it's 64. The... <laughs> okay. What, who needs more than that? That was yeah. what it was about. All right. So let's see. So I used to use those computers. Okay. But that's not what he said. He said 64. All right. Anyway. Uh, oh, yeah, here it says they po she popularized software engineering and took some chiding for it. it. The critics said it inflated her work's importance. However, <laughs> her work was very, very important. And I guess that's some of the some of the code. Is that what that looks like to you, Jeff? Yep. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, here he's correcting the article. It's okay. 72K of ROM. Ah. For... 4K of RAM. So ROM, read only memory. Correct. And then RAM is random access memory. That's Basically like, can be changed. Like uh, the difference between, um, well, I think of RAM as like your works, your work table and things can be put on and off of it. But read only won't, won't work like that. I was trying to think of a. Well, RAM, RAM is like a whiteboard. ROM is like a book. Okay. That's good. All right. So let's see. Uh, anything else in here I think is interesting and important. There's that picture again. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, the rope compensator for the Apollo computer's limited memory. The process created a very robust system. Uh, and this person is mentioned here, this Tiesel Mirror Harmony, a curator also at the Air and Space Museum and author of the new book, Apollo to the Moon, A History and 50 Objects. That was one of the reasons why the Apollo guidance computer worked flawlessly through every single mission, which is an accomplishment. If well, you think about how computers work now. Well, in fact, I think that the rope had to be read sequ sequentially. Mm. You couldn't go from a you know, spot to spot on the rope. You had to read it through. That makes sense. And either use or not use. Okay. Uh, she loved math when she was young. Yeah, let's see if I can find 
I think there's a picture of that rope in here somewhere, too. Oh, there she's getting the award from President Obama. In 2016, President Barack Obama awarded Hamilton the Medal of Freedom, noting that her example speaks of the American spirit of discovery. She actually was kind of little, wasn't she? Isn't she? <laughs> well, Barama's, Barack Obama's tall. Is he? Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Oh, Cliff, yeah. Yeah, I built a 286 computer, then updated to a 386. Worked great. Yep. Very yep. cool. That's what I started on. Uh, where is that rope picture? I wanted to show that. Oh, they, this is kind of fun. They have, um, they introduced a Lego of Margaret Hamilton. And it's, uh, I think it's got glasses and. Oh, right there. Oh, here. Right there. Okay, yeah, that's well. Here's the part as a working mother, she took her young daughter to the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory with her at night and on weekends. One day, her daughter decided to play astronaut and pushed a simulator button that made the system crash. Hamilton realized immediately that the mistake was one that an astronaut could make, so she recommended adjusting the software to address it. But she was told astronauts are trained never to make a mistake. Yeah, it doesn't mean that it won't bump while they're trying to push a button. Yeah. During Here it is. During Apollo 8's moon orbiting flight, astronaut Jim Lovell made the exact same error that her daughter had. Unfortunately, Hamilton's team was able to correct the problem within hours. So all the future flights, the protection was built into the software to make sure it never happened again. I love that. So Lauren was part of, mm -hmm. part of the solution. All right, let's see. I really want to see that picture. I forget where it went. Nope, it's not here. Let's see. Is it? I don't think it's here either. It's a really cool piece of hardware. Uh, again, a lot of nice information about her. Kind of short. Uh, let's see. There's some really good information here. But again, you want to look for Margaret Hamilton, software engineer, or NASA, not the other Margaret, when you go and check. Oh, oh, great. What happened? I thought this, Bad spam song. this wasn't here before. All right. Well, let's see. Can we find that picture? That's what I really want to see. I don't know how to get rid of that. There, it's gone. Okay. Uh, oh. Oops. Yeah. That's called it success oriented management. Okay. Assume things won't feel too much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, oh, Interesting. there it is. Ah, okay. Yeah. Is this it? Yeah, oh, and Cliff commenting on the error. Oops, I pressed that twice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, creating software programs for a space mission wasn't easy in the 60s. Margaret Hamilton and her team wrote out code by hand on sheets of paper, then used a key punch machine to punch holes into paper cards that were fed into the computer. You used that, right? The paper cards, right? Yeah. And they read the cards on these as instructions. After testing their punch card code on an enormous Honeywell mainframe computer to work on any bugs on a simulated lunar landing, the code was then shipped off to a nearby Raytheon factory. There, women physically wove the program's O's and 1's. That's the basic zeros binary, 0's and 1's, yeah. yeah. Through magnetic rings that represented the program's 1's and zeros. A copper wire through a ring meant 1, going around the ring meant 0, which is basically on and off. And you'll see... On a lot of the equipment now, it's kind of a circle with a line in it, and that's representative of on zero. and off. Yeah, yeah zero one. Yeah. Right, it's binary, binary codes being two. Uh, and this is a picture. This isn't the picture I saw, but that's pretty neat. I don't think I can click on it to make it bigger. No. Uh, Handwoven ferrite core memory as used in the Apollo guidance computer. The way the copper wires wound themselves through the magnetic rings of the memory represented the actual guidance software code used to fly to the moon, land on the surface, and return to Earth. So I bet, I suppose if it went through there, yeah. it just bypassed some of them and went through the rest. Right, yeah. And and the the red things are the are the magnets. Cores, yeah. <laughs> women, affectionately called LOLs, little old ladies, were expert seamstresses and their rope created a hardware, hardwired code for the modules that was effectively indestructible and impossible to erase. Pretty impressive stuff. So, um, yeah, there's another 72 kilobytes again. 
72,000 characters. So <laughs> they had 72,000 of those magnetic cores. Oh, that doesn't look like 72,000 of them. Huh. They might have gone through them multiple times. I don't know. Could be, yeah. Well, you could do it twice at least, right? Yep. For a, for a one and a zero, yeah. depending on. Anyway, all right. So um, <laughs> that's kind of cute. I didn't read this. How Margaret Hamilton's daughter may have saved the Apollo 11 mission. And we, we heard about that. She pushed uh, something and and mm -hmm. then yeah, pushed a button on a simulator and crashed the system. <laughs> yep. It could inadvertently happen on a real mission. Yep. <laughs> so that, that should be cool. That should be cool. I haven't read that, but I think I will. All right. And here's a little bit about this is NASA, another NASA page, NASA.gov, Margaret Hamilton, uh, a little more current picture, but um, the Wikipedia has something that's, where is it? She's um, more recently here. This is from 1995. But there's a good picture of Margaret in front of a computer. Yes, honors Apollo engineer, I think. Nope, just a few there. All right, so I missed the page with the with a whole bunch of uh, the honors on it, but I think this is the next part. So we're not going to go there. Yeah, you bring us back. There we go. So, Murray Hamilton. Way cool. <laughs> yep. I, I always love these because I learned so much. Cliff's got a comment. It's bigger than that stack. Yeah. The code, I think, the... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and the, yeah, the magnetic tours are tight. Okay. Ferrite oh. beads to cancel out inductance. All right. That I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know, of course, you got just so much time <laughs> to do the research and the show. So your comments really enhance the experience for mm -hmm. all of us. Thank you very much. Yeah, because everyone knows little bits about other stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So. I've um, mined. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So some stellar events this week, September 8th through September 15th. Globe at Night project continues. It started September 5th and is running through September 14th, which I believe is Thursday, 2023. In the north, look for Cygnus. In the south, look for Sagittarius or Grus, whichever one is easier to find, I guess. You, um, go out, take pictures and upload the pictures to the site and report um, how it looks compared to other pictures. I got another comment from Cliff. More layers than oh, that was. The rope. One slice. That was just one. They, they were a stack of of those. So that, was, that wasn't that was 72,000 there, but there were oh, multiples see. of that. I see. Thank you, Cliff. Yeah. Very good. So. And were you here? Yeah. September 4th. Um, the moon no, rides no, for no, September 8th. I don't know where I saw four. September 8th, the moon rides high. September 11th is Patriot Day. Um, oh, I found out why first, second, third, fourth, and then all of the others have the TH at the end. I found out why that, that is. Okay. It's a Roman holdover. Oh, interesting. They actually had different um, suffixes for one, two, three, and four. Oh. Because those were the important ones. Five, five was many. So one, two, three, or four, or many. Okay. Um, they, you they know the had, weirdest stuff. They had numbers for them, but they just, they weren't important. They weren't like the things that everyone, it's like, if you notice. Cliff two, says. Yeah, like cards stacked. Yeah. 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 If you've noticed, we have words to do what, to deal with two of something, a pair. And there's more words than that just for dealing with two of something. It's because at one point, one too many. I mean, one wolf, not okay. Two wolves, that's kind of bad. Three wolves, you better not spend your time counting. You know? <laughs> so, Alrighty. Okay. So, but September 8th, the moon rides high. <laughs> okay. September 11th, Patriot Day, and Venus and the moon are in are in conjunction. September 12th, the moon is at apogee. And September 13th, Mercury and the moon are in conjunction. September 14th is a new moon 
and Mercury appears stationary. And I think yeah, I, yet another appears stationary. Yeah, I think we should list them out as appear stationary because it's not really stationary. That's true. You're right, but they they well they, they list it, it just as, has S T A T next yeah. to the Mercury symbol. So yeah, speak it how you wish. Yeah, I'll say it appears stationary. It from appears now on. stationary. It's true because astrologers might think it stops, but yeah, but those of us who know astronomy it doesn't know otherwise. <laughs> September 15th is the Friday night show, and I'm doing another citizen science project. Stick around to hear which one. Find us Friday nights <coughs> at 9 p.m. Pacific time on the Everyday Spacer Facebook page and the Everyday Spacer YouTube channel. Also on September 15th, Moon is on the equator, and it's Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Uh, there was actually something kind of, oh, let me set it up, and then you can share. It's not ready yet. You guys with the weird <laughs> moons. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we've got like three moons in the sky. Sometimes it's just sitting on the equator of the Earth, which gravitationally I think would really be really bad. I'm 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 using the farmer's almanac. That's what they said. But sometimes it rides high, and it's not even 420. <laughs> so we haven't done this in a while, but I did want to make note of this one. Uh, other events and activities. If you are in Australia, Cliff, uh, go ahead and share the screen. You can name the rover. Uh, I found this on Facebook, and I think it was actually from Cliff, but then I went to this uh, Australian Space Agency page, and uh, they say you can come and vote for a name. You can you can help them. <laughs> it's upside down. Yes. I, I'm assuming you're talking about the moon, the moon not, <laughs> yes. not your rover. <laughs> I hope Although it's that not. would be ironic. <laughs> <sighs> so... So you can vote, and then a short list of four <coughs> names will be selected to put to a public vote. Well, you can you can nominate a name. You can go in and say what you know, give a name, and then there will be a vote for um, out of four names. The winner will be announced on December the twenty third. The chosen name will be engraved on the Australian made rover that will head to the moon by uh, by as early as twenty twenty six. The entries will close October. Uh, 20th, though. So let's see. Where's that in here? That's. <laughs> well, that's the paragraph that you just read off. Yeah. Well, here it is. October 20th. And what I did was I put up these two pages as well. So you can see that. And uh, then I think this is the entry page, right? Yeah. Enter the competition. Name the rover. So if you're in Australia, go for it. <laughs> Uh, see if you get to uh, name the, the rover. It's going, I guess, by 2026, somewhere around then. So if you or someone you know has done something interesting involving space exploration, science, or astronomy, we'd love to share our live. Join us again next Friday, September 15th, to hear about Gaia Veri, uh, another Zooniverse project. This, this really needs your help as well. Um, you will be processing data from the Gaia spacecraft. Yeah, we've been looking at the ones that say needs the most help mm -hmm. because then we're pretty confident they won't be completed by the next well, yeah. in by fact, the week we talk about them. The one that I wanted to do was the latest one posted, but it's like 98% complete. Yeah. And they've got an entire week. So unless they add more stuff, it's. Yeah. Hey, take care, Dave. Cliff. 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 <laughs> Just... Thanks, Cliff. Uh, and so we have a trivia question for you. What is the Gaia Space Observatory's mission? Join us again next week. We'll answer that and see if you got it right. All right, anything else from you? Nope. Let's see if I can get anyone else's name wrong. <laughs> wow. Anything else from you? Let's do a shout out because we had a lot of great people here tonight. Cliff and Daniel. I know Dawn was here. I miss Jamie. Jamie, I thought Jamie would be here. So, so Forrest, thank you for joining us again. And, and Hall. Hall, thank you for being here for the first time. And Scott, Scott's there. Yep. I think we got everybody. Yeah, you, you said Dawn, right? Yeah. Dawn, yeah. Yep. Okay. That was late for Dawn. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, folks. Have a really great week. We'll see you next Friday. Oh, expensive for <laughs> Eric. Um, when you come to the United States. Or are you talking on the moon? I don't know. <laughs> we'll talk about it, Cliff, because yep. Cliff will be here next March. Yeah. 
next March. We're planning out some fun stuff for him to do with us. All right. Thanks, folks. Have a great week. Yep. See ya. We'll see you next Friday. Bye. Bye.